Hi, I'm Brett Champion, Superintendent of Schools here in the Medford School District. We started the book No Talking, and today we're going to pick up where we left off last time. He sat back down and wrote, Hey, Captain Burgess, how's the war going? Ready to surrender? Dave nudged Jason, handed him the note, and pointed at Lindsay. Jason nudged Lindsay and held the note out to her, and when she glared at him, Jason shook his head and pointed back at Dave. Lindsay made a face and then took the paper, holding it between her thumb and forefinger like it was a squashed toad. She read the message, wrote a note, wrote a little, and nudged Jason, who passed the paper back to Dave. Her reply was, it's general, Burgess. <laughs> Check the score, Dimbo. Girls rule. Boys are losers. As usual, you're going to get totally schooled. Jason handed the paper back to Dave. He read her message, made a snarly face at her, and then wrote, don't count on it. Always the big talker. And sitting there frowning at the paper, once again, Dave felt this overpowering wish that he could show Lindsay, who was the boss, settle the question once and for all, really put her in her place. And in answer to this wish, an idea popped into his head, an idea he probably should have ignored, but he didn't. Pressing down hard with his pencil, Dave wrote, How about you and me go head to head, have our own special no talking match, starting right now, you and me, unless you're scared. And the winner gets to write a big L on the loser's forehead with permanent marker on the playground after lunch on Thursdays. How's that sound? And he gave the paper to Jason. Lindsay grabbed the paper from Jason and read it, and there was no hesitation. She looked at Dave, nodded a big yes, held up her hand with her fingers, making an L, and pointed at him. Then she wrote something and handed the paper to Helena, who read everything, wrote something, and passed the paper back to Lindsay, who wrote something more, and then passed the paper to Jason, who passed it back to Dave. Lindsay had written, Helena, you be the witness, sign here. And Helena had written her name. And below Helena's signature, Lindsay had added, No backing out now, fat mouth. Which color marker do you like best, red or black? Dave pointed at her and pretended to laugh and laugh. She stuck out her tongue and then turned away and picked up her chat with Helena. Dave felt like he had lost that skirmish. Lindsay always had a way of firing the last cannonball. Then he smiled as he thought how much fun it would be to paint a big big L on her forehead. If he could win that, if he could win that is. Otherwise, Dave wouldn't have put his feelings into exact words, but he sat there in the quiet room sort of wishing it didn't have to be a war because it was, well, it was very interesting. Not talking was interesting all by itself, even without the extra fun of the contest, and the extra risk of his new private battle with Lindsay. And he suddenly wondered what Lindsay thought about it, about the whole idea, and he wondered if she'd be honest enough to tell him. So Dave grabbed a fresh sheet of paper and wrote, I'm kind of glad we're all doing this, the no talking thing. Like, I really don't know, I really didn't know um was a word. It's pretty interesting, at least it is to me. Then he gave the paper to Jason. Jason tapped Lindsay's arm and handed her the new note. She read it and then gave Dave a short, suspicious look. Then she bent over the paper and wrote. Jason handed him the paper, and Dave read her message. It said, It is to me, too. I'm thinking and thinking and thinking. Pretty amazing. Dave turned and caught Lindsay's eye, and they half nodded each, at each other. For one tiny fraction of a second, it wasn't boys against girls, and it wasn't a battle. It was just, it was two smart kids <laughs> enjoying an idea. Jason handed Dave another note. From him this time. I'm not your personal delivery boy. Maybe you and Lindsay should sit at the same desk. Ha, ha, ha. Dave's face felt hot. He scribbled, you're crazy, onto Jason's note and jammed it back at him. And at the bottom of the page he and Lindsay had passed, he wrote, yeah, but no way are you going to win this fight. You and your stupid friends are going down big time. And as Dave tossed the note above Jason's head so it landed on Lindsay's desk, he made an ugly face at her and then shook his hands like he was trying to flip something gross off his fingers. He didn't wait for Lindsay's reaction. Dave turned away and began writing a new note to Scott. All during seventh period, Mr. Burton sat at his desk watching. He wrote some notes too, but they were notes to himself. No hesitation. Everyone jumped right in. Some frustration with writing. It's slow. Some anger displayed. A lot of nodding and gesturing. Some hand signals. Tapping on desks and arms and shoulders to get attention. Some poking too. Mouth sounds. Tongue. Clicking. Lips popping. Raspberries. Some animal sounds. Quacking. Whistling. Barking. Sometimes to get attention. Sometimes to bother. Not much boy-girl or girl-boy note passing, but more than I'd expected from this group. A lot of smiling and frowning and other face-making. Not one single word out loud. Mr. Burton was taking a, taking a class at the State University two nights a week, studying for his master's degree. The course was called Human Development, and one of the topics they had studied was the way children learn to use language. Of course, this wasn't watching kids learn to use language. These students were already good with words, almost too good. No, this was watching children try to change how they express themselves, trying to use language in a new way. Mr. Burton was pretty excited. It was like having his own private language lab. 
He thought, if I keep careful notes, I bet I can write my big research paper on this. I can do interviews with the kids once they start talking again, and I can gather information from the other teachers too. There's so much good stuff to work with. This is great. When the last bell rang, Mr. Burton was sorry the class had to end, and he couldn't wait for his first class on Wednesday morning. For the fifth graders, that last bell on Tuesday meant something else. It meant they had to go ride a bus and not talk. The bell meant they had to go to sports practice or to dance or music lessons and not talk. It meant they had to go home and deal with moms and dads and brothers and sisters and neighbors and everyone else and not talk. No one was sure how all this was going to work, including Dave. But Dave was absolutely sure of one thing. He was going to do everything just right. Because if he messed up, it meant he'd be walking around school on Thursday afternoon with a big L on his forehead. And that was not going to happen. Chapter 14. Seen but not heard. The homebound school buses were quieter than usual on Tuesday afternoon, especially the ones hauling a large number of fifth grade kids. But none of the fifth graders found the ride home very hard. With no grown-ups around, it was pretty easy to keep quiet. A few of them sat with friends and passed notes back and forth. Some read books or opened a notebook and did homework. Most of the fifth graders just sat quietly, looking and listening and thinking. For the fifth graders like Lindsay, who stayed for soccer or field hockey or cross-country after school, was just, it was after school was just like regular school because the coaches were all teachers and you could answer teachers because of the three word rule. Everyone was getting pretty good at that part of the contest. Soccer practice was easy for Lindsay. Instead of yelling for the ball like she sometimes did, she just waved a hand or made a motion with her head. To direct teammates to cover an area or move downfield, she pointed. Lindsay was good at soccer. She did most of her communicating with her feet. For the kids like Dave who went right home after school, not talking was more difficult, a lot more difficult. Because it's a fact of nature that parents don't like it when kids don't answer them. David? Dave had been home five minutes when he heard his mom come in from the front door, come in the front door and call his name. He was upstairs in the bathroom. She called again, David, answer me. To me, more specific, Dave was sitting on the toilet. David, answer me. Dave knew that count tone of voice. He had to do something right away, so he reached over and banged on the inside of the bathroom door. It was the wrong move. His mom was up those front stairs and had both hands on that locked bathroom door in two seconds. David, is that you? Are you all right, David? David, answer me. She was going to kick down the door. Dave was sure of it. He jiggled the doorknob, flushed the toilet, was up and zipped, buttoned all in about two seconds, and he yanked the door open and gave his mom the best smile he could manage. Mrs. Packer was so relieved, she bent down and hugged Dave so hard that he couldn't have said a word, even if he'd wanted to, which he didn't. But then she held him in, out in front of her and gave him a stern look. Didn't you hear me calling you? It would have been easy to shake his head no and tell a silent lie, but Dave smiled and shrugged and held out his hands. Then he pointed to his mouth. His mom frowned even more. Your throat? Is your throat sore? Is that it? Dave shook his head. But it's hard to talk. Something hurts? Should I call Dr. O'Hara's office? We can drive right over there. Dave shook his head again and motioned for his mom to follow him. He went to his room and then to his desk, and on a piece of paper he wrote, Sorry, it's a thing we're doing at school. Not talking for a couple of days. That's all. His mom looked at the paper. Not talking, she said. Don't be silly. Everybody has to talk. Dave smiled and shrugged, and he wrote, Not all the time. His mom tilted her head back and made a face at him, nodding slowly. Oh, so you're saying that I talk all the time? Is that it? Again, Dave smiled and shrugged. Because I could be as quiet as anybody. Then she added, If I wanted to. Bending over to pick up a sweatshirt, she pushed it into his arms and said, Well, anyway, get the rest of these dirty clothes picked up and go downstairs and start unloading the washer. Only the dark colors, all right? Dave made a face, and she said, And don't give me any of that sass, mister. At his karate class, Kyle did a front snap kick without a yell. Mr. Hudson bowed and said, Kyle, son, always yell like this when you kick. Hiya! Now you! Kyle did the kick again, and he moved his face and mouth, but he didn't yell. Mr. Hudson's face got red, and he walked stiffly like he always did when he was displeased, but he was still being polite because that is the karate way. He bowed. Kyle, son, did you not hear me? Ben Ellis walked onto the mat and bowed to Mr. Hudson. He was in fourth grade. When Mr. Hudson bowed back, Ben said, hudson San, the fifth grade kids aren't talking, none of them. hudson San bowed and made a wise face and tried to imagine what the teacher in the movie Karate Kid would have said in the situation. After a long pause, he said, ah, I see. Yes, silence. It is good. Then he bowed at Kyle San, and Kyle San bowed back. Then Kyle did another snap kick without yelling. Ellen played the first flute piece for her teacher, but there was a problem. Mrs. Lennox said, all right, we're in 4-4 time here. She used her pencil and pointed at a quarter rest. How many beats of silence do you allow for this rest? Ellen tapped once on the music stand. Her teacher said, correct, but just say one beat. Then Mrs. Lennox pointed at the symbol for a whole rest. And how many beats for this one? 
Ellen tipped out four beats. Just say four beats, dear. Ellen smiled and tapped four times and then pointed at her mouth and shook her head. What? asked Mrs. Lennox. Again, Ellen pointed at her mouth and shook her head. Your lips? Something about your lips? asked the teacher. Just tell me, dear. Ellen smiled and shook her head. Then she lifted the flute to her lips and played the piece again, and this time she read all the rest perfectly. Her teacher nodded, smiled, and then turned the page to the next piece. Before Ellen began to play, Mrs. Lennox pointed at each rest, and Ellen tapped out the right number of beats. The teacher nodded, and Ellen began to play. When she finished, Mrs. Lennox smiled, pointed at the start of the piece, picked up her own flute, and nodded, and they played the whole piece, to get, piece again as a duet. Neither of them said a word for the rest of the lesson. Brian's mom picked him up at school, and when he got in the car, she said, You need a haircut. We're stopping at Zeke's on the way home. Brian groaned and shook his head. He stamped his feet on the floor of the car. His mom kept driving. Brian hated going to Zeke's modern barber shop. Zeke was this grumpy guy who'd been cutting hair in Lakedon for more than 40 years. He gave everyone the same haircut, short on top and buzzed close on the sides. But the last two times he'd been there, Brian had forced Zeke to do a halfway decent job, but only because he practically yelled at the man the whole time. Not so short on top. No, really, that's enough off the top. And don't use the clippers on the sides, just scissors. There, that's enough. Don't cut off anymore. Really, no, please, no clippers, just scissors, please. And that's why today was the wrong day for a haircut. If Zeke got him into that worn-out barber chair, Brian knew he'd end up looking like something that had escaped from the zoo. When his mom parked the car, Brian jumped out and dashed into the pizza place next to the barber shop. But his mom followed him. He pointed at the menu, but she shook her head. There's no time for a snack. We have to pick up your sister in 15 minutes. She took him by the arm and pulled him out of the restaurant and over to Zeke's door. Now get in there. Quick. There's no line right now. Brian wanted to say, Newsflash, Mom, there's never a line at Zeke's. The man's a rotten barber, and he has bad breath. But Brian couldn't say that, and he wouldn't be able to talk to Zeke either. He was doomed. Fifteen minutes later, when his big sister got into the car... She took one look at Brian and burst out laughing. She said, Zeke, right? Brian could only nod. He had paid a heavy price for keeping his mouth shut, but he'd kept his promise to Dave and the other guys. If they didn't beat the girls, well, it wasn't going to be his fault, and he had the bad haircut to prove it. Was it worth it? Yeah, he thought. It was worth it. So what if I looked like a monkey for a week or two or three? Brian stared out the side window and tried not to think about it. Mrs. Burgess was worried. She glanced in the rearview mirror and looked at her daughter's face again and thought, did she have a horrible day at school? Is that what's bothering her? Or maybe something happened at soccer practice. That coach of hers can be pretty rough. About a month earlier, Lindsay had started riding in the back seat of the car instead of up front. Her mom had noticed that her bright, chatty little girl was starting to become more serious, sort of distant now and then. And today, not even a word, and barely a nod as she got into the car after practice. Lindsay's mom thought, Maybe she's giving me the silent treatment because I said she couldn't go to that sleepover at Kelly's this weekend. That's probably it. Kids, be, kids can be so moody sometimes. Goodness knows I was. The truth is, Lindsay wasn't feeling moody at all. She was just thinking. Actually, she was thinking about thinking. Not talking all afternoon had made her realize something. For years now, she had done most of her thinking out loud. I've been just blurting out whatever's on my mind. To my sister, to my mom, and at school, I just go on and on. And then I talk on the phone all night. Incredible. Lindsay hated to admit it. But Dave Packer might have been right about the top of her head exploding because that's how it had felt at first. She felt like a faucet had been wide open, gushing and gushing forever. And then suddenly it flipped shut and all her thoughts had been bottled up. And by the time school let out, Lindsay had started to enjoy the change. And all during soccer practice, she'd felt like she was alone, just her and her own voice. And she'd felt like saying, hi there, I'm Lindsay. Remember me? I live here. Thinking and being quiet. It was different, and it was good. As the car turned onto their street, almost home, she looked up and saw her mom's eyes in the car mirror and instantly felt how worried she was. So Lindsay gave her mom a wave and a big smile, and her mom smiled back. All over town, the other fifth graders were figuring out how to get along without talking. Were there any mistakes made on Tuesday afternoon? Yes, but only a few. Every single fifth grade girl and boy was working hard not to talk. And later on, as it got to be dinner time and family time and homework time and bedtime, there were other problems the kids faced. A phone call from Grandma, a little brother who needed help with homework, a family trip to the mall for new shoes, lots of situations that begged for spoken words. Every single kid had unusual experiences. Tuesday night, and every single kid had to be creative. I'm sorry. Every single kid had unusual experiences Tuesday night, and every single kid had to be creative and alert and quiet. But it's not time to tell all about all that. It's time to go back to school, back in time, to about 3.30 on Tuesday afternoon, 
back to the conference room next to the office because that's where the principal and the fifth grade teachers had held a special meeting and they'd had plenty to talk about. Chapter 15, Control Center. So, you've been with our fifth graders all afternoon. You've seen and heard what they're doing. What do you think should be done? Mrs. Hyatt looked from face to face around the conference table. Mrs. Marlowe spoke right up. We should get them all in the auditorium tomorrow morning and lay down the law. Just stop it. It's silly. It's disruptive. I mean, it's interesting and all that. And with these kids, it's maybe even an improvement, but it's still not right. It was sort of cute right after lunch today, but then I had the second group and then the third during seventh period. And by then it was just a bother, a real distraction. We've got a lot of material to cover in science. So I say we should squash the whole thing right away. Mrs. Escobar nodded her agreement. It's very annoying in math class, these short answers they use. It's a game to them, and that's all they're paying attention to. I'm trying to work, and if they're playing a game, it's frustrating, very frustrating. So if this is a vote, I say we stop it first thing tomorrow. Mr. Burton shook his head, but why? It's very inventive in what they're doing, and it's creative, and they're all thinking, and I think it's mostly positive, too. They're all exercising some self-control, which is a big change for this group. I think we should try to make a have a sense of humor about it. Just let it run its course. It can't go on for very long, can it? What's the harm? Well, it's not a problem in the gym, said Mrs. Henley. Actually makes it easier, me not having to yell and all. I've got no complaints. If they want to be like they were this afternoon the whole rest of the year, it's perfectly fine with me. It's not fine with me. That was Mrs. That was Mrs. Oh, it's not fine with me. That was Mrs. Akers talking. I only get them for music two or three times a week, and I need to make every minute count. And I asked Jim Tory, and he feels the same way about art class. I went along with it this afternoon, and we had some fun too. But I can't afford to waste more class time. I can't teach them songs if they won't sing more than three words in a row. I just realized something," said Mrs. Overby. You know what the, that little rascal Dave Parker did yesterday? Instead of giving an oral report, he stood up at the front of the class and coughed for two, maybe three whole minutes. And he was pretending, I'm sure of it, so he wouldn't have to talk. This really has to stop. Mr. Burton said, but don't you remember? We're talking about the unshushables. These kids have been driving the whole school nuts for years and years. And suddenly, like some amazing gift from elementary school heaven, they all stop talking. And what are we going to do? We're going to start them right up again. That doesn't make sense. Why not wait a little? You know, see what happens just for another day or two. What's the harm in that? Mr. Burton honestly didn't think it was a problem. But even if he had, he would have asked the other teachers to back off anyway. He was hoping the quiet time would go on long enough for him to gather more information for that paper he needed to write for his human development class. The principal had heard enough. She was glad to get everyone's opinion, but she didn't want the teachers turning against each other. This was her school, and like everything else, this decision was her responsibility. Mrs. Hyatt said, Thank you for your thoughts. Very helpful. But this is not a voting situation, and I've made my decision. You know I've been trying to get these kids to quiet down ever since they were in first grade, so it's tempting to go along with this activity of theirs and hope it will lead to an improvement, but I think that would be wrong. The sudden quiet might seem easier than all the noise, but neither behavior is really what we want. These children need to learn to be quiet when it's right to be quiet, and they need to talk and participate at the right times too. We don't want an all-or-nothing situation, which is what this is. What we need is real balance, real self-control. If we let them keep up this game or contest or whatever it is, I think we'll be sending the wrong message. So we need to have an assembly tomorrow. I've noticed that Lindsay Burgess and Dave Packer seem to be the ringleaders. And I, actually, Mrs. Marlowe interrupted, I think it's more like Dave and Lindsay are sort of team captains. They're keeping score, counting words, and it's the boys against the girls. I intercepted a note. The principal raised her eyebrows. A note? You didn't tell me that. Mrs. Marlowe shrugged. It was this afternoon in my classroom. Mrs. Hyatt said, it might have been helpful if you had told me about this sooner. The principal paused, letting everyone feel how displeased she was. And in that moment, Mr. Burton thought, women, always keeping little secrets. Interesting. But he immediately corrected that thought, because anybody who hangs on to stereotypes about girls and boys shouldn't, especially if he's a teacher. The principal said, anyway, that's good to know, and I think I see a way to approach the problem. So at the start of homeroom, please bring all the students to the auditorium. It was quiet for a moment. Then Mr. Burton said, what are you going to do if the kids don't respond to your approach? Mrs. Hyatt looked at him, a trace of frost in her eyes. What do you mean? Well, he said, I'm just saying that we've got five years of experience with this group. They've never obeyed very well, and we've told them to stop being noisy. Why should it be any different when we tell them to stop being so quiet? 
Mrs. Hyatt stared at Mr. Burton a moment, and in her mind, a little voice said, leave it to a man to say something negative. But of course, she immediately corrected herself because that kind of thought can get a principal in trouble. On a school faculty, it's never supposed to be girls against boys. In fact, that's called discrimination, which is against the law. So Mrs. Hyatt looked around the table, smiled, and said, all I can promise is that I'll do my best to resolve the situation in the most orderly way possible, and I know that each of you will do the same. See you all the first thing in the morning. As the teachers left the conference room, there wasn't much talking. In fact, there was none. Chapter 16, Orders. It was a bright November Wednesday, and the morning playground at Lakedon Elementary School rang with the usual shouts and laughter of children. But there was another layer of schoolyard activity going on, if a person knew what to look for. Because all around the swing sets and the jungle gym and the baseball diamonds, small groups formed up as fifth grade friends passed notes and gestured and play acted, trying to tell each other what had been happening since Tuesday after school, trying to tell each other all the clever ways they'd gotten along without talking. The fifth graders were so glad to see each other. They felt like they had spent Tuesday night in lonely prison cells, practically in solitary confinement. There was also some contest business being conducted. It was time for the first test of the overnight honor system. As agreed upon beforehand, boys who had spoken illegal words reported to Lindsay, and the girls reported to Dave. As Dave received the morning confessions from a short line of sheepish girls, he felt pretty good. He added 15 more points to the score against the girls. Lindsay felt good, too. By holding up fingers, four boys admitted that they'd spoken a total of 12 forbidden words, which seemed suspiciously low to her. But the rules were the rules, and she had to trust that the boys weren't lying, just like Dave had to trust the girls. And Lindsay admitted to herself that there might be a few cheaters on both sides, so it probably evened out. Anyway, she wasn't worried, because she was pretty sure the girls were still winning. When the first bell rang, everyone went inside. Dave was in Mr. Burton's homeroom. When the second bell rang and all the kids sat silently at their desks, the teacher said, Please line up at the door. We're going to a special fifth grade assembly this morning. If anyone would like to guess what it's about, just speak up. No one did, but Mr. Burton could tell from the looks on their faces that most of them had a pretty good idea. He smiled and said, But don't worry. Who could be upset with such beautifully behaved children? Not me, that's for sure. After his group had filed into the auditorium and, gotten their, and taken their seats, Dave turned and looked for Lindsay. She was sitting next to Kelly, and they were passing a note back and forth. She didn't look concerned at all. Dave turned away quickly so she wouldn't notice him looking at her. If Lindsay wasn't worried, he wasn't going to worry either, even though this assembly had to be about their contest. It had to be, didn't it? There had never been a special assembly at Lakedon Elementary School before, at least not that he could remember, and there had certainly never been an assembly that had begun in complete silence like this. Lost in his thoughts, Dave didn't notice Mrs. Hyatt walking onto the stage. And she said something, too, but he missed it. Scott Vickers elbowed him in the ribs, and Dave snapped back to the present, just in time to see the principal looking right at, it, right at him. Dave, I said, I want you up here, too. In a daze, he looked around quickly and saw that Lindsay was already walking down the far aisle. So Dave lurched to his feet, scooched past his classmates, and hurried down the aisle and up the four steps onto the stage. Mrs. Hyatt stood between them, and she said, now, as you know, students, we always begin an assembly with the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Lindsay, Dave, you will lead us in the pledge this morning. Everyone, please stand up. <laughs> the whole fifth grade rose to their feet in silence. Dave glanced across at Lindsay, and she glanced at him, and the look they exchanged was clear. What should we do? Lindsay gave a tiny shrug, and then they gave each other an even tinier nod. All of this happened in less than a second. And that's all it took for each to know that this was the right time for a temporary truce. Dave and Lindsay looked out across the faces of their friends, nodded, put their right hands over their hearts, and turned to face the flag. Signal sent, signal received. These kids hadn't talked for more than 18 hours. Every fifth grader took a deep breath, and if the pictures of Washington and Lincoln on either side of the stage had been painted with hands, they would have used those hands to cover their ears. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The kids spoke with one voice, almost shouting, incredibly loud, amazingly powerful, probably the most rousing pledge of allegiance ever heard in a public school during the entire history of the nation. The auditorium echoed, and it seemed to take a moment for the room to stop shaking. As Dave and Lindsay hurried back to their seats, Mrs. Hyatt, her ears still ringing, said, Thank you. That was excellent. 
I have called this special fifth grade assembly so that every one of you gets the same message at the same time. As of right now, and here the principal paused and swept her eyes over the upturned faces in front of her, the contest or game or whatever you'd like to call this sudden quietness or this three words in a row business you're all doing, as of right now, it's over, ended, stopped. It was interesting, and I hope you learned something, and we all hope that you also enjoyed yourselves, but I have decided that it needs to stop. What you've been doing has made it very difficult to have normal, productive classroom activities, and of course, that is why we're all here, to learn as much as we can every day. So is that clear? The room was silent, and then a scattering of kids replied, Yes, Mrs. Hyatt. The principal said, Is what I am saying clear to everyone? This time, the whole group responded, Yes, Mrs. Hyatt. There was no sudden rush of whispering, no undercurrent of talking in the auditorium, no joking and laughing, none of the usual behavior that the unshushables were so famous for. The group remained silent. And Mrs. Hyatt realized something. Yes, the kids had all responded to her, and just now they had all obediently said, Yes, Mrs. Hyatt, but that was only three words. And now it was still completely silent in the auditorium. So to really prove that they had actually agreed to behave normally, well, she would have to get them all to start talking normally. But the principal instantly decided that this did not feel like the right moment to push it. Better to let the teachers work it out with smaller groups, one class at a time. So she smiled at the fifth graders and said, Thank you for listening so carefully, and now I hope you all have a wonderful day. Teachers, you may take your first period classes now. Mrs. Hyatt watched the classes leave one by one. It was a very orderly exit. All the kids were behaving extremely well, but it didn't feel right. It was just too quiet. Chapter 17, Alliances. As he walked toward his first period class, Dave felt relieved. He was glad Mrs. Hyatt had put an end to the contest. He was especially glad that he wouldn't have to actually mark, mark a big L on Lindsay's forehead, or the reverse of that. Now he could just think about his schoolwork again, because he really was a pretty good student. That's why he was in the high math group. But as he went into the math room, he didn't talk to his friends, and they didn't talk to him. And none of the girls were talking either. No one was actually sure that the contest was over. And no one was taking chances, including Dave. The bell rang, and as everyone took their seats, it was still completely quiet. Mrs. Escobar got right down to business. All right, students, we're still working on metric conversions. And let's see, who's got an answer for the first homework problem? Lindsay raised her hand, and when Mrs. Escobar nodded, she said, 312. Mrs. Escobar frowned. 312 what? Lindsay said, degrees Celsius. Mrs. Escobar looked at Lindsay. You heard what the principal said a few minutes ago. Lindsay nodded. About how this little game needs to stop? Lindsay nodded again and then raised her hand. Mrs. Escobar nodded, and Lindsay said, but why? Why, said the teacher, because it's not good. For anyone, it slows down our classwork. Like right now, we should be doing math, and instead we're talking about not talking. Lindsay said, math is numbers. Yes, said Mrs. Escobar, but we need to use words to talk about how we're using numbers. You know that. You all know that. So stop this right now. Lindsay stood up and pointed at the dry erase board. May I? Mrs. Escobar said, go ahead. Lindsay had her homework paper in one hand and a marker in the other. She wrote out the numbers for the first problem and then showed the three steps she used to get the correct answer. She turned to Mrs. Escobar, and when the teacher nodded, she said, How's that? Mrs. Escobar was starting to boil over. I am not amused by this, Lindsay. I know what you're doing, and I will not stand for it. Now stop it. Lindsay looked at the board. She pointed at the problem. Is it right? Another three words. Dave knew that look on the teacher's face. It meant trouble serious trouble, and not just for Lindsay. He held his breath, waiting for the explosion. But the very next moment, Dave amazed himself. He raised his hand. Mrs. Escobar had to grit her teeth, but she managed to say, yes. Dave pointed at the solution on the board and said, mine is different. Without asking permission, Dave was on his feet. He grabbed the marker from Lindsay and scrawled his work onto the board. He had the same answer, but he had worked with fractions instead of decimals. Mrs. Escobar said, How many of you did it the way Dave did? About half the hands went up. And the way Lindsay solved it? The other half went up. The teacher nodded. That's good. Does everyone see why it can be done both ways? Everyone nodded. Okay, here's a tougher question. Kelly, which way was easier, Dave's way or Lindsay's way? Kelly said, Lindsay's. Really? Asked the teacher, how come? Fewer steps, 
And all around the room, Mrs. Escobar saw heads nodding, saw the special light that shows up on a kid's face when understanding happens. We'll pick up where we left off tomorrow.